Up next on Eco Company, a museum full of creatures, some a little creepy, but some very beautiful. We have about seven million insects in this museum. It's the second largest insect collection west of the Mississippi River. We'll learn how some insects are being affected by climate change. Then Eco Company takes a trip to the Joint Genome Institute. Teens here are helping scientists with climate research. It'll help us know how much permafrost will contribute to um, the emission of greenhouse gases. They're studying secrets held captive in the permafrost. Plus, the majestic redwood. Some can live up to 3,000 years old. Redwoods are the longest living organisms and the tallest organisms on the planet. How will climate change affect redwood habitats in the years to come? And energy drawn from deep down in the earth. We're talking geothermal energy that taps water from the earth's core. All that and more coming up on Eco Company. Thanks for tuning in to Eco Company. I'm Jordan. And I'm Adam. Today we head into the world of some tiny creepy crawlers. And some beautiful butterflies. So you don't usually think of insects when you think of climate change, right? Well, even the world's tiniest creatures can be affected by environmental factors. And I think I found just the right place to learn more about it. Hey guys, we're at the Bohart Museum of Entomology. And this isn't just any museum. You'll never guess what's in all of these. Insects like these gorgeous butterflies can tell us a lot about climate change. Let's go find out more. Take your pick of bugs, creepy crawlies, or even these walking sticks. If it's an insect you're looking for, chances are you'll find it here at the Bohart Museum of Entomology on the campus of University of California, Davis. Senior scientist Steve Hayden makes sure everything's in order here, down to the tiniest of creatures. Steve, tell us about this museum. There's so much going on. We have about seven million insects in this museum. It's the second largest insect collection west of the Mississippi River. So why study bugs? Well, for one, they play an important role in our food chain. Bees give us honey, but also they give us like apples and apricots and all kinds of fruits through their pollination effort. And there's some small flies that give us chocolate when they pollinate the chocolate flowers on the chocolate plant in the tropics. Insects are also the backbone of our ecosystems. Mess with them and nature knows it. But a warming planet is threatening many species, changing plant habitats they rely on to survive. And in some cases, their habitat could be destroyed altogether. The rising of the sea levels as the ice sheets melt will actually end up covering some islands. And the insects on islands are commonly unique because the islands are isolated from other areas around them. That's bad news for creatures like this green guy. These are a kind of a walking stick that lives um, in some of the Caribbean islands. And this is an insect that might be affected by uh, climate change. Since being on an island, it has no place to go. It kind of has to sink or swim on the island. So here, you want to hold him? The walking sticks are definitely cool. But another big crowd pleaser here are the butterflies. That's Swallowtail from New Guinea. That's where Professor Art Shapiro comes in. He's known as the butterfly guy in these parts and beyond. In fact, Shapiro's behind one of the most extensive butterfly studies on record, funded by the National Science Foundation. Art's been trekking out to the same sites in Northern California and the Sierra Nevada for nearly 40 years. So he's seen what warming temperatures and habitat changes can do over time. We're in Gates Canyon, one of his study sites. Whew, so much stuff flying around. Let's catch up with him to see what we can spot out here today. A lot of California hair streaks. Who's that in the road? That's another buckeye. You were just buzzed by an echo blue. Here comes a pale swallowtail, my little crescent. There's a Lorquins Admiral right there. That's a farmer skipper. And there's a tailed copper down there. We're up to 23. There's a uh, buckeye posing right by the roadside. See him opening and closing his wings? Let's see if I can catch one. Oh, you got it. Oh my gosh. 
What kind of butterfly is this? That's a Mylitha crescent. It's one that breeds on thistles. What kind of tree are we looking at and why is it so good for butterflies? It's the California buckeye. It is the best nectar source for butterflies in late spring. It's habitat like this that plays a key role in insect survival. Are butterflies being affected by climate and how do we know? Definitely they are and especially um, in extreme climates, particularly at high elevations in the mountains and in the Arctic and sub-Antarctic. So species that live in colder climates that are warming are the ones most in trouble. And back at the museum, Art shows me a few. This is one of the ones from my study sites in the Sierra, which is contracting apparently as a result of climate change. This is a butterfly known as an Arctic, found in very cold climates. They go all the way up to the shores of the Arctic Ocean. It's getting more local, more rare, and the marginal populations are apparently on their way out as a result of climate change. If the climate continues to be this way, what does this mean for butterflies? They're going to have to adapt or die. It's that simple. And it's the past that's filed away in these drawers that could help predict the future. You actually owe a lot more to insects than you really realize. So even the Earth's tiniest creatures are affected by climate change and other environmental factors. They can tell us a lot about the world we live in. The Earth holds many secrets that can help with the scientific study of climate change. Brendan's headed to a national research lab where they're working to unlock the secrets captured in permafrost. There, he's meeting up with teens that are helping with the study. Hey guys, we're at the Department of Energy Joint Genome Institute, where scientists are using DNA from different organisms to become leaders in environmental research. For instance, they're studying plants like these for biofuels, and they're unlocking the keys to climate change with microbes. Some high schoolers are helping them out. Let's go see what they're doing. It's a place where you'll never know what kind of weird science you'll see, or just how cold things will get. How cold it is? Minus 80 degrees Celsius. But one thing's for sure. Scientists here at the U.S. Department of Energy Joint Genome Institute are on the cutting edge of research into climate change and global warming. And that includes these two lab coats, high school juniors Lindsay Pieper and Shalini Majumdar. We've been lab partners for two years already, and like so we already knew that we worked really well together, so we we're really excited to do this together. They're helping researcher Rachel McElprang study permafrost and how it fits into the global warming picture. Permafrost holds a lot of carbon in its solid state, and when the permafrost starts to thaw, it activates these microbes which are living in the permafrost, and these microbes can consume the carbon and produce greenhouse gases. And once the greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere, it can cause this positive feedback loop of thawing and warming. Lindsay and Shalini are here thanks to a joint partnership with the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab BLIPS program. They're focusing their efforts on one gene in particular. They have been looking at a particular gene that some of the microorganisms in the permafrost have. And this particular gene is very important in the production of methane. It's work that requires safety goggles and gloves, not to mention a lot of precision. Basically, we want to determine how much of this gene there is in the permafrost and um, its diversity uh, among the other known MCRA genomes already. As you can imagine, you've got to keep those samples cold in a freezer like this. These right here are samples from our ancient DNA projects, so for example, mammoth and Neanderthal. How cold does it get? To minus 80 degrees Celsius. Minus 80 degrees? Minus 80 degrees Why does it have to be minus 80 degrees Celsius? Uh, because even over the very long term, uh, things can degrade, and also we have some very sensitive samples uh, that we need to keep that cold to preserve them. Somewhere it's not so cold, in here. It's where powerful computers sequence the genetic material. So these are the machines where we actually sequence the DNA. Okay. So that is, we determine the order of all of the nucleotides, the A's, C's, T's, and G's, that make up the genomes of the many different samples that are sequenced here at the JGI. Essentially the information that's stored on the DNA, right? Yes, it's, it's the blueprint. The DNA is then placed on one of these flow cells and put in this machine. So in like a two-inch piece of glass, you have DNA? Yes. That's all DNA? 
DNA is on this piece of glass. Wow. Sequencing helps identify the microorganisms in permafrost soils. They're key to understanding how thawing impacts global warming. This has not been well studied because the permafrost actually hosts a diverse array of microorganisms and we haven't had enough sequencing capacity until recently to study those. It'll help us know how much permafrost will contribute to um, the emission of greenhouse gases to further understand climate change. It's an issue that these interns say is important. I think uh, climate change is an issue that um, everybody should know about and I wanted to study it more, know more about it. When you can put biology and re research that includes environmental perspectives with biology, I think that's really important to being environmentally aware. As for what all this research means, they're just scratching the surface. We are only just starting to understand this. This will require uh, long-term studies, not only at uh, one or two different sites, but at permafrost locations uh, all over the Arctic. And so this is a very large problem uh, in the context of global warming. And it's a good thing these guys are on it. Coming up, the oldest and tallest trees in the world, but their numbers are dwindling. Today, only 5% of what we call old growth redwood forests exist. What the future holds for the ancient redwoods. Then, talk about a big microscope. How these teens are using it to study photosynthesis. More Eco Company is straight ahead. Redwoods have been around for thousands of years, dating back to the age of the dinosaurs. But there aren't so many around anymore. Jelena met up with the researcher to find out what the future holds for these majestic redwoods. They're the biggest trees in the world, some towering 25 stories tall. But climate change threatens them all. They're redwoods, descendants of a group of conifers that flourished more than 144 million years ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Redwoods are the longest living organisms and the tallest organisms on the planet. Today, only three types remain. The giant sequoia, which can live the longest at more than 3,000 years, the coast redwood, and the dawn redwood. Thought to be extinct until 1944, when it was found in China, you can find all but the dawn redwood in the western U.S., mostly along the Pacific coast. Today, only 5% of what we call old growth redwood forests exist. So we would consider redwoods a very highly endangered ecosystem. The rest has been logged. Redwood is such a fantastic building material that in less than 100 years, 95% of the original redwood forests in California were destroyed. Dr. Healy Hamilton is a biodiversity scientist at the California Academy of Sciences. I do all kinds of research about how to conserve the diversity of life. She's using state-of-the-art technology to come up with detailed maps that predict how climate changes will affect redwood habitats in the years to come. Our research is trying to examine what climate models say about where the climate that redwoods need to survive might exist in the future, and especially trying to identify places where the climate won't change that much, a place that we might call a climate refuge for redwoods in the future. How does fog and the climate affect redwoods? You know, researchers at UC Berkeley have discovered that fog accounts for almost half of the moisture that a redwood tree needs to survive. So that's one reason that they cling to this really narrow stretch of the California coast. This map shows the current state of ancient redwood forests and this map shows the best case scenario for the future. All climate models are run under different scenarios of how human society will respond to greenhouse gases. Are we gonna work really hard to reduce them or are we just gonna have a business as usual future? And what would happen if all the redwoods went extinct? You'd lose an entire ancient forest ecosystem. You'd, you'd lose what many people have described as nature's cathedral 
and all the plants and animals that depend on this ecosystem would disappear as well. We would have less richness in the diversity of life around us. It's an ecosystem she's passionate about saving, and she says it's up to us all to protect these living giants. If we don't do very much to reduce greenhouse gases as a global community, if we don't make this a priority, it's pretty grim for redwoods and a lot of other species. There's not a lot of room left for them. They can't adapt fast enough to how fast the climate will change under a business as usual scenario. It's a scenario that we can prevent to keep these trees around for decades to come. And really the future for you and all of the kids of your generation, it's gonna be determined by what we choose to do today. So it's really our responsibility to make sure they have all of ours, yes. Next up, teens doing research on renewable energy. In a renowned national lab. More eco companies still ahead. Geothermal energy, photosynthesis, sounds like research for scientists, right? Well, in this case, those scientists are teens, and they're doing research on renewable energy in a national lab. This may look like your ordinary classroom at the average school, but these guys aren't in school here at all. They're interning at one of the nation's top labs. These high schoolers are part of the Summer BLIPS program at the U.S. Department of Energy Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. BLIPS is uh, the Berkeley Lab internship for pre-collegiate scholars. How are you guys doing? Tom Knight is its program manager. We partner high school students in the summer after their junior year with a researcher here at Berkeley Lab to do scientific research. A lot of research is environmental, involving renewable energy, fuel efficiency, and more. And high schoolers like Francis from Puerto Rico are getting to be a part of it all. I'm learning a lot and having fun here. She's studying geothermal energy at the geysers, the largest geothermal plant in the world. My favorite parts are the field trips, the geysers and the Santa Rosa. Geothermal energy taps water from the Earth's core, where it's hot. It creates steam, which generates electricity. So why is geothermal better than any fossil fuels? Well, it's better because it's natural and it doesn't make any damage to the environment. It doesn't release CO2 or anything. It doesn't. It's like really clean and pure. In this case, there's an added twist. They're using recycled water to make that steam. We're getting the water, the wastewater that comes from home businesses and industry. The wastewater goes through a series of different treatment steps so that it's been very, very cleaned up. And then it goes through a 41 mile long pipeline up to the geysers, goes up about 3,000 feet in elevation, and then it is distributed to a variety of different injection wells where it's put back into the geothermal reservoir. Geological scientist Pat Dobson is mentoring Francis as she puts together an educational outreach presentation. We're trying to increase the awareness and knowledge of geothermal energy to the general public. What Francis is doing is putting together a web page that will provide information to the general public and go and find out more about this process. So to solve climate change, we're basically turning back to mother nature, what with like solar using the sun, wind using wind, right. <laughs> and now geothermal using the, the, the heat earth. of the earth. And yeah. so, I mean, if we're looking at energy solutions, it's gotta be more than just one answer. The, the needs for power are so great. That brings us to this lab, where students are studying another way to replace carbon emitting fossil fuels, and that's with plants. They're the source of life practically because they provide the oxygen we need and they clean the air that we breathe. Camila and Maxine are creating a movie about photosynthesis and ways scientists are trying to produce it artificially in order to create fuel. Scientists nowadays are trying to find a more efficient and cheaper way to make fuel storable and to reach uh, the world's demand. The problem is that natural photosynthesis doesn't reach that demand. They're using this electron microscope to scope out plant cells. They're looking at the structure of chloroplasts, where photosynthesis occurs. Artificial photosynthesis mimics natural photosynthesis. And instead of producing the sugars and ATP that is produced by natural photosynthesis, artificial photosynthesis produces a fuel that's storable and transportable. All of their work goes into their video. It's a project that requires T for teamwork. Well, it's pretty cool to have somebody to like, you know, like a check and balance for each other. <laughs> yeah. That way it's very fun. 
Whether it's using energy from beneath the ground or figuring out how to copy nature above it. Nature is like the basics of why we're here. These teens say they're glad to be a part of finding solutions to environmental problems. I think we've grown as students and as scientists and it's made us more conscious of the problem of how and how people around the globe are working on it. And for these budding scientists, this is just the beginning. If your campus is doing something to go green, we want to hear about it. Grab your video camera and start rolling. Create a video and upload it to our website at eco-company.tv. Well, that wraps up another episode of Eco Company. Thanks for watching. For more information on the stories on our shows or to give us feedback, check us out at eco-company.tv. Or fan us on Facebook. We'll see you next time on Eco Company.